Na? Sveiki visi, šiandien prisijungi prie antros architektūros kokybės vystymo asociacijos organizuojamos paskaitos. Iš nuotolinių paskaitų ciklo polčio turtinga architektūra. Kaip matote, ciklo finansuoja Lietuvos kultūros taryba ir UAB Jung Vilnius, o partneris yra SA.LP portalas, tai yra žurnalo architektūrų ir statybų portalas. Kadangi šiandien paskaita vyks anglų kalba, tai aš tada irgi toliau tęsiu jų anglų kalbą. So, greetings to everyone who joined us today for the lecture, as you can see, that will be held by the sociologists and atmospheres of the city's researcher, PhD, Annette Stenslund. And she will talk on uh, designing atmospheres, a product and a method for sustainable urban development. As you see, it's called the uh, question mark. But uh, first, let me introduce uh, our lecture, today's lecture. And um, Annette Sandslund uh, works as a uh, assistant uh, professor at uh, Roskilde uh, University in, in the Department of People and Technology. Uh, her main interests uh, in, in, are topics within social sustainability. It means like healing architecture and then public spaces, design processes, uh, capability design, participatory design, cross-sectoral and cross-cultural collaboration dilemmas. Uh, so she is interested in uh, knowledge production, intuition, and uncertainty. Uh, I am very keen to read um, her thoughts on uh, atmospheres and uh, our urban surroundings. Uh, so Annette uh, writes, I am interested in how we smell, sound, look, touch, and are touched. That is, the significance of sensory experiences for the way we feel as humans, the way we organize socially on both large and small scales, and the ways we shape, create, a new and changed societies. Sensory perception is not only a mo molecular physiological and neurological phenomenon, but also a cultural and social phenomenon that affects us deeply. Therefore, sensory experiences are, for me, the entry point to studying social life and the way we navigate the world. And actually, and also today's lecture is based on her uh, book, famous book, Atmospheres in Urban Design, a Workplace Ethnography, that uh, uh, she published at Rutledge uh, Publishing House in 2022. And um, uh, she made her uh, uh, empirical study uh, for keeping uh, visiting architecture Bureau, famous architectural, Danish and architectural bureau, SLA, for a couple of years. And uh, based on her uh, observations and research, she uh, published this book. And also she will share her insights during these years with us today. So uh, I'm uh, stopping uh, sharing the screen and uh, the floor is yours. You are welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Aida. Labas. Labas, Diana, yeah. do you say that? Labas, yeah. <laughs> Good day uh, to all of you there, out there. And uh, thank you very much for attending. Um, and also thank you for the kind introduction. 
Um, also, I'd like to express my gratitude uh, to you and the Association of Architectural Quality Development for taking this initiative to organize this highly relevant online lecture series on sensory rich architecture. Uh, the significance of paying attention to sensory rich architecture, um, which I will discuss discussed today uh, through the lens of atmosphere is crucial uh, because of our multi-sensory reality of hum uh, as humans with social and technological practices. So not only can uh, addressing our full sensory experience be beneficial, enriching and socially inclusive, thus also sustainable, but I argue from the perspective of the atmosphere that it's necessary to be sensitive also to the potentials that can emerge within the public realm and the architectural workplaces as, as such where atmosphere can unfold. So I may also uh, challenge this idea of what it means to sense and to see so even vision, uh, even if it's been a domin dominated or hegemonic sense uh, in our culture, um, it can also, I argue in this lecture, evoke other senses and Im through our imagination. So when you either contact me to, to, to speak about atmosphere in urban design, you, you explained how it's essential for the architectural industry to orient itself, not just visually, but multi-sensorily. And I fully agree with this necessity, but I will also challenge a bit, I think, uh, of what we perceive merely as visual. Um, so one of the reasons, and you mentioned that, that you invited me was because of my book, Atmospheres in Urban Design, which be, came out a few years ago. And it was part of a bigger research uh, project called Living with Nordic Lighting, based here at uh, Roskilde University from where I'm speaking today. And it was funded by uh, the Velux Foundation. Um, this book is about how a well-known Nordic architecture firm called SLA works to develop atmospheric qualities in urban design and urban spaces. So, uh, and, and the firm is named after Steve L. Anderson, SLA, who started this company in 1994. Uh, and when I talk about atmosphere here, I mean the sensory feelings or the felt sense of space or situations. Uh, at first, I was curious about, about how uh, a studio like SLA works with atmosphere in their urban design. So how do they uh, think about it and how do they actually then do it? So as we all know, and as uh, Donald Schoen and Chris Aguirre's would be among the first to tell us based on their observational studies within design and engineer com companies in 1974, there can be quite a gap between espoused and enacted practices. So what people and here practitioners say they do does not always mirror what they actually do. So, and this is why it calls for an outside look and inspection, which is what I've made one of my main tasks today as a researcher, namely to observe, observe the working cultures and processes of architects, landscape architects and artists from an outsider's perspective. And look, um, I did some slides for you. That so I will sh switch now. So the uh, and share my screen. Um, do you see my screen now? You're nodding. Yes, yes. 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 Okay. Thank yes. you. 
So if I scroll down here, so this is how I see myself as an outsider uh, um, uh, watching architectural work from the inside. I'll share with you some of my observations and analytical digestions of what I witness architects, landscape architects and urban designers do when working with the atmosphere and projects. Um, but first it's necessary to give you insights into what I understand by atmosphere uh, as a phenomenon because it doesn't always align with what architects and designers understand by our atmosphere in their daily work. So I'll try to make this explanation clear, but it will necessarily involve a more theoretical explanation. After defining atmosphere, I'll need to check whether you're still awake and with me and then if we are lucky, I will carry on uh, and introduce you to my ethnographic fieldwork at SLA. And finally, I'll share with you some of the empirical findings about how this studio works with atmosphere. And I can already tell you that I was in for a surprising and educational experience which is reflected in my title today also, because uh, during my field work, it became clear that the urban designers I followed were not just set on creating atmosphere as part of their services. As time went by, I became quite curious about how their daily work was immersed in atmosphere itself. And I suggest considering this as a kind of method, if you will. Um, and by the way, I'm not thinking of method as a systematic predetermined procedure or a set of guidelines to follow. Instead, I see it as a way to approach the design process involving the ability to engage in dynamic dialogue with drawings tools, computers, images, materials, physical surroundings, weather condition, etc. Um, so my work has so far been particularly driven by an interest in designers relationships with the world of things and physical surroundings and the possibilities for material resonance. Um, and you will find out more about this too. I'll close by telling some of the implications for architectural practices and do a small recap uh, of my main arguments and we will have a Q&A in the end. So, okay. Um, I will begin, sorry, I'll begin by uh, unpacking the concept of atmosphere and explaining its complexities, which cannot be solely attributed to individuals or to architectural sketches or the orchestration of tangible elements like materials, sound, smells, light, etc. I will emphasize the uncontrollable nature of atmospheres, which is easiest for me to explain by drawing on the concept of resonance as defined by Hartmut Rosa. Uh, therefore, you can now expect uh, a cross-reading of philosophical and sociological sources, which I use to shape what I believe is the best understanding of atmosphere in architecture and landscape development. Um, okay, um, so, um, a lot has happened in just the last 10 to 15 years in terms of how we generally understand and talk about atmosphere. It has been most common to refer to the atmosphere as a meteorological phenomenon, namely 
with reference to the mixture of gases that surround the planet. However, um, atmosphere can also mean the air that you breathe in uh, a place. Occasionally, it can be stuffy. So airing out and a few plants might improve it. Uh, but a, and a third meaning of the word somehow overlapping might refer to the character or feeling of a place or situation. And it is these latter understandings that should interest us most today. The atmosphere I'm interested in is still an airy phenomenon, you could say, in the sense that it cannot be anchored geographically to a specific space. Atmospheres float in the air and they morph like clouds do. So when I define atmosphere in what follows, I align myself with a new phenomenological and new aesthetic tradition defined respectively by Hermann Schmitz and Gernot Böhme, two philosophers who we were fortunate to have among us until very recently. Hermann Schmitz writes that, and I quote here, Gefühle sind räumlich, aber ortlos ergossene Atmosphären. And in translation, it would say feelings are spatial, but placelessly diffused atmospheres and other where he, uh, he writes um, or elsewhere he writes uh, and bodily grasps, grasped forces. Uh, I will uh, attempt to explain the ontology of atmosphere based on this concept of uh, body. Uh, namely light and connected to resonance as a world relation characterized also by uncertainty, not as something to be eliminated, but something that we might learn to navigate in and which can be seen as a productive driver for new thinking and innovation. But first about the bodily anchor. Um, um, I would like you not to read the quote, that's why I'm hesitating. <laughs> um, but if you could just listen and I will get to the quote later. According to new phenomeno phenomenology, and new is a bit of a stretch because uh, while the roots go back to the 60s, new phen phenomenology is considered as uh, to have established itself as a distinct phenomenological current during the 80s, primarily driven by Schmitz and Böhme. So anyway, according to this current, human existence is a bodily condition present in the world as a sensing and feeling being. We are bodies. This means that we are emotionally affected by the quality of our surroundings, its sensory aspects and aesthetic services, surfaces. In German, the body can be referred to as both Körper and Leib, and there are significant differences in the choice of terminology. Now, I believe that you have the same level of nuance in Lithuanian, Kunas perhaps, uh, although I won't claim to be an expert. But while Körper refers to the material, physical body, like bones, flesh and blood, as defined in natural and medical sciences, life is an integral part of human emotional and sensory engagement and understanding of its surroundings. It is through their life um, that we are touched sensory and emotionally by the qualities of the surroundings, smells, temperatures, light, etc. Therefore, from this light perspective, there is no external material world um, in itself in the form of climatic conditions, landscapes or architectural constructs they become phenomena experienced as part of our state of being. 
in German, we talk about Befindlichkeit, which is a way of being. So how do we do? How do we, how, how, how do we feel today? This is part of how we are given as bodies. So sensing from this perspective is more than just registering, re registering sensory stimuli. And the following quote here from Böhme captures the idea that our sensory experience shapes how we find ourselves in a state of being, wie wir uns befinden in German. Um, um, so he writes, I write in, in German, I'll try to translate. Sinnlichkeit ist die Weise, in der sich ein Mensch in seiner Umgebung befindet. Das heißt zum Beispiel, dass wenn es schlecht riecht, der Mensch es nicht bloß etwas Übles riecht, sondern sich übel befindet. Die Farben, die einen umgeben, zu sehen, die Geräusche, die auf einen eindringen zu hören, bedeutet unmittelbar, sich in bestimmter Weise zu befinden. So, if I am to translate uh, into English, it sounds something like the following. So, Sinnlichkeit, it's difficult to find a suitable word of Sinnlichkeit in English, but we could perhaps say sensuality even though it may have an erotic connotation. We can also say sensibility, even though it may have an unintended understanding of vulnerability. But Sinnlichkeit, sinnlichkeit refers to this sensory perceptual way of being situated in one's environment. And this Sinnlichkeit, and I quote, is a way in which a person finds themselves in their environment to see the colors that surround one, to hear the sounds that penetrate towards one, means to find oneself in a certain way immediately." Unquote. And as an example, you can recall after a long winter, how the smell of early spring perhaps affects you, your way of being. It does not only become lighter and warmer, it may also change you into a more joyful version of yourself. So this is how you find yourself uh, in this sensory situation. So ontologically, for simplicity's sake, we can think of atmosphere as space in between. In Lithuanian, I think such spaces are called tapas. I don't know, perhaps. Um, so atmosphere exists beyond the subject-object dichotomy, which means that we must find them not in people, in the architects, landscape architects or the designers, or not in the architecture as such, in the planting, the materials, but between human beings on the one hand and the physical surroundings on the other hand. And this, regardless of how much the latter, the physical surroundings are touched by human hand or left untouched, whether a design or what we with Matthew Gandhi would consider as a non-design. It is this in between, the, in this in between, both physical objects step out of themselves. Bume refers to this as an ecstasy, that things step out of themselves um, and show themselves or reveal themselves to us. And it's, uh, it is often forgotten that the same applies to human beings, that they, we necessarily step out of ourselves, also as designers or architects. In this perspective, we understand that atmosphere is neither the property of the individual alone, nor the physical surroundings, but a relational phenomenon that arises in the encounter between, for instance, an architect and the material environment. 
So an example, our private mental state does not alone determine the atmosphere of, for instance, a library building, a workplace, or a public square. Our personal state of being might color the atmosphere, and it can take part in it, uh, and it can contribute to, contribute to it. But humans and things in atmosphere will step out of themselves and meet. Um, this is something Martin Heidegger has an eye for. Uh, and he writes, in this experience, in this living two words, there is something of me. My eye goes out beyond itself and resonates with the seeing. Uh, and by seeing, Heidegger does not only mean seeing by sight, but every sense does so, he writes in a footnote. Um, only through the accord of this particular eye does it experience something environmental. So there we can say that it worlds wherever and whenever it worlds for me, I am somehow there. This quote from Heidegger is from his uh, early work towards the definition of philosophy from 1919, and I like it for several reasons. On the one hand, he shows that our environmental experience is a living two words. It is an outward reaching. And on the other hand, he shows that it involves resonance between the self and the outside world in a sensory attuned relationship. And where Heidegger might speak of a world worlding, um, which we uh, we are fully immersed in our when we are fully immersed in our surroundings, I would speak of atmosphere as this kind of resonating world relation, characterized by an interconnectedness of I and world, and that is the ontological condition of atmosphere. Now, I hope you're still with me uh, because I have one more important thing to say about my understanding of atmosphere before I turn to the empirical part of my work. So I attach great importance to the concept of resonance and thus Hartmut Rosa has also found a central place in my work. Resonance is... Um, originally a concept from physics used to describe how a system is subject to an influence with the frequency from another system that sets a, the system in motion. So transferred to a human context, Rosa speak of a, speaks of a resonant relationship between humans and the world where first we as humans are touched by our surroundings, bodily, sensually, and emotionally. So that was this would be the red file um, turning uh, towards this human being. Uh, second, we respond uh, with a state of being where we where, where we get out of ourselves and reach out to our environments. And there in this uh, resonance relationship, there, there is a transformation happening. Something will change. We will change and our surroundings will change. Um, and finally, Re uh, Rosa pinpoints resonance is uncontrollable. So, for instance, if we master, subdue, and control our surroundings, also as architects, we, pre we can prevent materials from speaking back to us in ways we cannot predict. They will metaphorically speak only our own language, so the world we put 
the words that we put in 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 their mouths we could say and thus we will it will tell us it will not not necessarily tell us anything new perhaps because we do not notice when that until they uh, they possibly break um Anthropologist Tim Ingold uh, has some very beautiful reflections on what it means to create um, craftsmanship, to do craft craftsmanship. Um, through examples, for instance, of willow weavers, he shows that materials like the willow allow certain movements, and it is through this interplay between these materials, the fibers of the willow, and the human movements and actions that forms, um, uh, where form emerge. In this way, Ingle argues for form giving as a process of mutual influence between humans and materiality, where both parties are active participants in the creation of forms. As Hartmut Rosa argues, the uncontrollable is an essential part of human existence that we should not attempt to eliminate entirely. It provides a form of resistance and challenge can be uh, can be and its challenge can be meaningful. So if everything was under complete control, um, life would lose its depth and authenticity. <clears throat> this uncontrollable nature, uh, when it shows us something or makes us behave or react to it, um, um, is, is the nature of resonance, uh, which has become also my understanding of atmosphere, which lies also at the heart uh, and their connection uh, to uncertainty which is not to think of as something that we do not necessarily know uh, as an unknowing, but something that we're not necessarily, we, we, when we engage in our surroundings, our sensory surroundings, we are not necessarily certain about how it develops. Um, I will not distinguish further between these context, but clearly uncon the uncontrollable and uncertainty have a family resemblance. Um, so now let's see what this perspective brings in terms of understanding the architectural practice. So the episodes I will share with you about the work of urban designers are mostly taken from ethnographic field work conducted in 2019 and 2020, where I was uh, at uh, SLA for nine consecutive months. Um, and SLA is a nature-based design studio. Um, we design places for nature, they write. And the intensive field study has since been supplemented by other partnerships and dialogues, but most of the examples here I will share with you are from moments uh, taken while I was with SLA. Um, and while I was there, uh, SLA employed 130 people covering more than 15 nationalities and their interdisciplinary team comprised mainly architects, landscape architects, biologists and planting experts, a few anthropologists, city planners and lighting designers. Their interdisciplinary composition means that I prefer to call them urban designers. This does not give precedence, uh, precedence to specific disciplines. And why is uh, and why SLA? Um, the short answer why I entered into a collaborate collaboration with SLA is that they claim to work with atmosphere. 
And the way they distinguish themselves within this, this industry is by offering an aesthetic surplus, they say, in each of their project solutions. So normally projects are characterized by having utility value, obviously. For instance, it could be the need of rainwater solution, noise reduction, regulation of user behaviors, etc. Issues that are often addressed by clients. Um, what is interesting is that SLA's business is maintained by advising on solutions uh, on issues like these, but also they see it as a duty to design solutions that are characterized by an amenity value, which involves atmosphere. And they themselves talk about atmosphere often as the aesthetic amenity value. And here is a quote. It's important that everyone who works here is aware that our actual errand is not to create a climate adapted urban space, the utility value, but to give urban space an aesthetic value. Our DNA makes us less fixed on utility. Climate adaption might be the mean, but the goal is atmosphere. This is how Steele Anderson tells me in an interview. I'm not interested in entering a discussion of what counts the most uh, as most important uh, when and where. It utility, utility and amenity value, I would say, go well together. My point is simply to show you the obvious re reason for having a particular interest in the work done by SLA. Here is another quote illustrating their pronounced interest in, in atmosphere. And this I find in their archives. In urban space, it's all about creating moods and atmosphere that attracts people. So I thus entered into a unique agreement with SLA for which I am still grateful to Steele Anderson. They onboarded me almost like a regular employee offering me a desk and a PC and a freshly created email account with my initials. And from this space in this office that you see here, I could access office activities. And my workplace ethnographies consisted of uh, observations. So during each day of field work, I would participate as an observer in SLA's internal and external affairs. I joined in in-house meetings and out-of-house meetings with collaborators, municipalities and contractors. Uh, I had informal conversations, for instance, uh, in front of the coffee machine or during lunch breaks. And I conducted interviews, 32 interviews with employees. Um, together with the designers, I went on site supervisions that offered a unique chance for walk along interviews. I was not only present in the office watching employees in front of the screens, scrolling in and out on their mouses, building mood boards, discussing drawings and sketches. I also went outdoor, walking and talking, further enabled us, that is my informants and me, to share our vision or limited vision because sometimes we went out at night in darkness while hearing, smelling, and feeling the kinesthetic sensation and rhythm of our gates. Occasionally during site visits and inspired by anthropologist Sarah Pink's method methodology, I asked for reenactments of observations from the designers. That is, um, I inquired if the designers could redo observations of areas around the, uh, the city that had informed their drawings. And I would lend them my camera to photograph 
what they had originally captured with their own camera, usually their phones. Um, so this allowed me to see through the designer's eyes uh, and what caught their attention, how they moved around and what they listened to. In short, the aspects the designers focused on and those they did not focus on, which I all would have to learn about. And as mentioned earlier, I also granted access to um, explore the office archives. Here are some uh, photos of how it looked like uh, indoor in the office. Um, and here we are outdoor uh, in the field. <clears throat> it's important to clarify that the empirical information I've collected at SLA cannot be empirically generalized to all uh, architectural or landscape architectural firms. So just because I observe the practices of SLA does not mean that every other firm operates in the same way. Naturally, I cannot make broad statements about standard industry practices of what happens at every architectural company based solely on my knowledge of one firm, even if I today am in dialogue with several others. I discuss my findings with designers from other companies um, or um, as discuss, I discuss my findings, it is becoming apparent that there can be significant differences in approaches to the design profession. And I'm for finding more similar approaches perhaps by among landscape architects than I have encountered at several large architectural firms who occasionally also outsource the sensory and aesthetic work to external collaborators. And this is still an evolving area of study. Nevertheless, regarding of the work focused on SLA, SLA, I um, sorry, I aim not, uh, the aim was not empirical generalization. Instead, my work consists of developing understandings, insights, and conceptual, of, conceptual frameworks through which other designers, architects, and landscape architects can gain, gain fresh perspectives on their own practices. And this calls for what we could call analytical generalizations taking an atmospheric approach to develop a conceptual lens through which one can scrutinize and reflect on one's professional practice in new ways. Now I will now turn to the findings of atmospheric ways of working as urban designers. <clears throat> um, one activity, so actually I followed all phases in the design process, which means that I would observe the architectural practices from the moment that the employees would start a project until their submission of tender. So I cover, so to speak, cases from the initial design phase involving sketch proposals in the preliminary design into the phases where designers draw in detail solutions for construction. But here I will highlight one activity that thoroughly caught my attention, which was the making of collages. I was clearly drawn to them as I find them highly appealing, like small pieces of art. And what did not make them any less interesting is that I would have to learn how collages were produced, discarded and produced again abundantly in a, and in a jiffy during the conceptual development for new potential projects. So they clearly had a function and were not just for decoration, uh, if we can put it that way. 
So um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with where the collage is. Literally, collage means gluing or sticking together. And it's a way of making an image in which various cutout materials, for example, paper, cloth, photographs or paintings are stuck onto a plain two-dimensional then di two-dimensional surface. A collage stays flat on paper, linen, or in this case of point, pixels on a computer screen. Only 10 to 15 years ago, collages made by SLA were created using paper, scissors, and a photocopier. Today, however, when designers collage, future prospects of the cityscape, it happens primarily on the computer screen and typically they are made in Photoshop, which allows the manipulation of a number of images separately. For, Im for, for example, images of paintings, a bit of landscapes, sky, earth, stones, or other materials that can then be layered on top of each other moved around above, below, next to, and across each other. In this sense, it resembles a photomontage, the composite element of uh, image of elements from separate sources. What I learned along the way by following the architect's works while I sat on their shoulders almost to follow what they were doing behind their big screens, was that usually the collage would serve as internal epistemolo epistemological tools, difficult word, that is uh, tools that, uh, to think with, tools to ask relevant questions with, tools to embrace uncertainty with, and hence tools that would help a project mature, evolve and progress. In short, they were ways of working with atmosphere and resonance and the uncontrollability or the questioning of how things would behave. And one point I ask Yoko, an architect, what purpose the collage serves to her and she explains, when I have a question I want to investigate, I make a collage and then it'll start asking questions in return and I'll need to respond to, uh, that I need to respond to by way of describing the collage to my peers. And then I try to put some words on, on the collage so through this process, I become more distinct in the way that I express myself about the concept and I get better at putting words to what we decide to draw. In most cases, the collage seems to bring, to bring the expressive capacity to the designer to a higher standard. It morphs or transforms the designer exactly as I, um, in, uh, as I intended to describe how the, the atmosphere, the, uh, I understand the atmosphere, how it works. So this transformation is uh, going on in the designer and, and the, the way they um, proceed on their project idea and the narrative. So the way that it manages to do so is by having a free and playful form that allows still vague ideas to be sketched out and given a visual expression that can then be tested further in a dialogue with colleagues about how to progress. <clears throat> and Yoko, Yoko carries on. Um, She says about this collage, I'll present it, uh, I'll present it to my peers and say like, in this collage, we've, we've examined this meeting between nature and its existing context. 
We think it could be exciting to work with the edge near the waterfront or whatever the qualities are that I find interesting, she says. So the collage is taking an ex extract of what we want to work on and then the others, her peers, might challenge the idea. Oh, shouldn't there be more green or whatever? And even if the quantity of green was not my intention with this collage, then I nonetheless find out something new from the collage. I may not find solutions, but I become aware of issues that I need to take into account for the next draft that I do. So we see here how the collage helps vague ideas to become more definite and clearer. Much of this work involves a sensory engagement, I suggest. And at the same time, uh, 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 and this uh, takes, um, and it happens through imagination. Um, I will give you one more example of how sensory these collages are. In the same interview as above, uh, Yoko um, tells me that we should not get hung uh, up on the detail about what is where in the collage. So standards of reality here are not what matters most. So here we see a clear distinction. These are not visualizations as renderings, you know, uh, the images that we know on from uh, 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 the front covers of magazines. Um, but um, to exemplify these collages, um, uh, this, this one is made for the development of Levantkai, a place in the North Port um, of Copenhagen, where some large heavy rocks are placed in the foreground. The sea is rough and rain is pouring down from a cloud-covered sky. The sea surface seems almost beaten by the rain here. And in reality, this spot at Levantkai may not look exactly this way depicted by the collage. The stones might be oversized, and they are not to be found exactly that close to the cargo quay. And the wind normally wouldn't come from a, uh, would come from a different uh, direction, which makes this scenario with waves hitting the dock a rare sight. But this is not really the issue here. In the Levant Kai uh, collage, one should be able to imagine how it would feel to be in a place. Feel the blowing wind, the bite of the cold, the roar of the rays, the play of them sunbeams far out in, on the horizon uh, and the grip of the concrete out under our feet. And it is qualities like these that roughly out outline what we may understand at as, as atmosphere, the felt sensation of being in a place or a situation. As uh, the Finnish architect Palasma has said, the collapse invigorates the experience of tactility. And I argue that in, in this sense, the collapse transcends the visible uh, through the way it gestures atmospheres. It points to something other than what is seen by the eye because it enables a sense of touch, sense, or hearing. Well, that's not sensation, you might think. It is an illusion or just a thought. But this is what I will have to say about that there has historically been a discussion about the dichotomy between mind and body, which can be traced back to antiquity and particularly which was also emphasized by René Descartes. So even though 
the criticism of a rigid dichotomy is well known and acknowledged, acknowledged it still somehow seems to linger. However, as Mel Opensee already pointed out in our, our mind and our uh, cognition are deeply embedded in and shaped by our bodily existence and sensory experiences with the world. So the mind cannot necessarily be separated from the body. What this implies is that we must be extra careful not to fall into the trap of thinking that cognition and the brain as an organ are not part of our body and sensory experience. Our cognition is sensory situated in the world. So therefore, when I tell you that architects feel and sense when they work with computer generated images, uh, I'm also saying that their imaginations are sensory experiences. In a way, I am arguing for a temporal extension of sensory experience. And I will give you a few other examples. Um, as I was talking, before I speak to you about this uh, case, uh, I was talking with, uh, with uh, an ex uh, highly experienced landscape architect uh, and I asked him um, uh, so uh, that several I said that that you know several research studies highlight the importance of being physically embedded in environments to fully sense and feel their atmosphere uh, and um, and I asked him then if this was also how he experienced that um, as something that he could recognize when working with the atmosphere of places. And then he said, um, he said to me, you suggest that you should have uh, walked, uh, we, that I should have walked around out there and felt the environment, right? What I understand, uh, I understand what you mean, he said to me, and I love walking around barefoot through the landscape, the feel the stream and the stone and take in, in all the wipes of a place. But uh, I must say to you that I don't need it anymore. <laughs> um, so what I'm telling you is that I know by, by now how it feels and sometimes it is easier to prepare project that are that are that I am physically uh, in a distance to. So uh, he reacts. He actually described uh, in that conversation to me how he over the years um, has such a large centuries repertoire of knowledge that he does not see um, it necessary to visit all the areas necessarily in order to to have a sensory approach to them. So what I note here is that there seems to be a temporal extension in the sensory experience that we can recall how it would feel to walk around in an area perhaps. And, and, and what I claim is that uh, architects often uh, do uh, imagine the sensuous quality when they want to bring out uh, that, that they want to bring out in their in their drawing. So uh, this is again, it is a, a designer who is about to design a skirt, um, and you know. It's it's um and in this skirt she while she's trying to to um to find out the expression uh, how it should look like um and she's very occupied with inspiration from nature then she starts to imagine um an earthen wall and she she explains to me that there's something seductive um there is something seductive about 
seeing a cut either through a mountain, dunes or other masses of soil. So there may be some knobbly transitions between the layers and each layer of soil tells its own story of what geographically happened at this time. So she, so while she makes or try to make the shape of this, this skirt, she recalls how it feels, this knobbly feeling of uh, touching a wall, uh, an earthen wall. And she then tries out and tests out in, in 2D uh, several times. And she's not quite happy about the expression. As she said, it becomes too uh, hierarchical uh, in this uh, right, uh, the left side of uh, the image you see here. And, and she finds this uh, hierarchical, you know, she tries to work with the layers. So you see this horizontal layers uh, inspired by her, by her imagination of an earthen wall. But it still is not quite surprising to her. It still does not uh, seem to what she really likes is that it shows her something that she cannot predict. And this is uh, almost like she she sort of expect the the materiality or the image to to show her something that she could not uh, uh, foresee. Um, so first, when she she turns to three D um, visualizations, and and she and she includes. Uh, uh, there's the sunlight, uh, shadow, shadow uh, play, uh, how the sun uh, sort of unfolds these these structures differently. She starts to get um, curious about what it tells her. So suddenly these shapes are no longer hierarchical, uh, but they are they they feel more organic. And she can't really predict how the shadows are starting to play around on this wall. So here I, I start to sense how she also resonates with the, 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 the image and how she tries to work with it as, as uh, it unfolds. And then suddenly she has a meeting with some colleagues and, and she starts to explain to them, oh, but, uh, you know, the first draft and uh, they didn't really work well, but now I think I got it. Uh, and she says, it feels a bit to, to her like, like whipped cream, she said, you know, this effect of, of becoming surprised about how this whipped cream starts to, 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 to show some shapes that are unpredictable. Um, and it is exactly exactly this effect that is uh, what she calls astonishing. It is something that emerges and so she, that she cannot control. And this again is is also what fascinates me when in my, on my understanding of atmosphere is that exactly this feeling of allowing not to control or to foresee a structure, but to allow also um, sensory uh, effects that might turn the expression into something very different and unforeseeable. That is what is happening here um, by including sun uh, sh uh, shadow, the, the sun and um, shadow, um, uh, what are they called? Uh, the, um, uh, you have a program where you, where you sort of uh, can can integrate these uh, sun shadow um, measurements uh, or calculations. Calculation was into the the how it, they react on on three D. <clears throat> so. In this sense, it becomes very sensuous uh, uh, as a way of engaging with the image. And it depends on both her imaginations, her sensory experience, and this way of relating to the material 
that is uh, also a way of allowing the uncertainty or the unforese unforeseeable. This is how it looks in close up in her 3D. <clears throat> An architect was was working with um, with uh, waterfalls, <laughs> and she then explained to me, yes, but a but a waterfall is not just a waterfall. Um, and what she was curious about is that um, so it was a uh, what in 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 um, German would call stofflichkeit. So the way the fo water falls as a quality was in was, was of interest to her. So, and again, she was very uh, interested in this way that uh, of the unforeseeable and the uncontrollable or unpredictable way that water can fall. <laughs> so she said, here to the, to the right, this is just a water curtain. Th that's boring to me. It's like, it's just, you can predict how it sounds. Uh, there's no disturbance. Uh, visually, it, it, will, it will stay the same all the time. What, what becomes of interest to her is that it, it could be more intriguing in, in the sense that she could get surprised. Um, so, uh, so she tries to see, search for some disturbances when... For instance, she would allow wind to come in and disturb how the water will fall. So, and then she will she will sort of um, um, be occupied and interested in how how wind uh, shapes the wall and how water then behaves with and resonate with wind and with her experience, or. She would she would search for uh, um, for stones or something uh, on the earthen uh, or the bottom of uh, um, uh, the earthen, earthen floor that also could could disturb how the how the water would move around. So this is a way to to um, create some kind of unpredictable. Uh, um, uh, qualities in in the design. <clears throat> and the thing is that um, if I should just carry on, it, it's that um, I mean, um, to her, atmosphere would be about exactly these astonishing atmosphere where, where, where she would get surprised or or that she, where she would expect the users or the citizens out there to become surprised and have something to 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 dwell on and to well get surprised and um, um, but um, but to me uh, atmosphere is everywhere. So what I claim is that, this water curtain is another kind of atmosphere than what she is searching for here uh, as something, uh, an atmosphere of excitement or astonishment. Um, but atmosphere theoretically can be quite boring uh, that we know from cover magazines. Um, <clears throat> They are quite different. They work quite, quite different. And uh, recent studies, for instance, by Jill and Rose and Monica Deegan and Claire Melouich, have made significant advances suggesting, for instance, that designers' visual productions here in, in, uh, in, in the sense of uh, visualizations they they have they 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 have atmospheres they 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 even claim these are digital atmospheres and so they are these atmospheres that are made here they are made in detail they are not made in a flu uh, fluffy you know they they are sort of very expensive to make and they are they are not uh they they are not so unforeseeable in the way that designers work very carefully with them so uh, and they determine what exactly uh, is here the message, and there should be no questions here. 
no nothing that that we we should um these these uh, visualizations are to sell i mean they are they are the money shots as as you might know so they they are to seduce the stakeholders and uh and they after having seen these images they shouldn't be the be um having any answers uh they should clearly know that that this project is a winning pro project and they certainly know how exactly this will unfold. So these are atmospheres that are that are, uh, other ways to to make use of atmospheres that are that are that are play with certainty or or try to do it. And that, that it's very what what I find very very important is that we distinguish between uh, the images done by architects because often we 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 just speak about oh um, architects and, and landscape architects they are so visual and they they are only visual and. They, they, we often speak about these images, namely the, the visualizations or the renderings that are made in detail. But, but, but what fascinates me is uh, that images are, are more than that. Um, and what I've come to learn about is that, that clearly different kinds of images serve different kinds of purposes. Um, Yes, and and what is very exciting uh, is and that 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 what theoretically resonates most with with my sense of 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 uh, atmosphere in the sense of, of uncertainty would be one kind of uh, of image, namely the collage, and and then at other uh, other images would would um, would have atmospheres that that play with. Um, certainty points. So what I've tried to explain here, and it's just a small, um, some few examples, um, and there are plenty of them in my book, um, but um, main points are that atmospheres are, to me, omnipresent, the uh, relational phenomena arising from the dynamic interplay of human bodies and material environments. They are rooted in our felt, sensuous attunement and thus can never be fully pre predetermined or controlled through design alone. They will always occur to the people on the streets out there, they always depend on the people and the culture situations uh, that unfold. But also this happens, I say, in the studio, um, clearly where the designer cannot be in control of what, how uh, this design unfolds. So uncertainty is an escapable part of atmospheric experience, I say, I claim, that designers can learn to acknowledge and creatively work with, rather than trying to eliminate through excessive control. Um, I'm still to meet a designer who is not willing to play and approach work creatively and uh, to work with this res resonating relationship. And I think what, what, um, what is important to, to notice is that uh, it is um, uh, the client's uh, expectations that also um, um, asks for, for a predictable and foreseeable outcome that that designers actually need to to um, need to work with, uh, of course, and to acknowledge and to address. And and but but 
still also to acknowledge that if this amenity, if they are to strive for this amenity value, there's something going on within the studio that could be kept for themselves as designers, as a as a method of how they can create the unforeseeable uh, excitement in their design that uh, that deserves some attention. Um, <clears throat> So an open explorative design approach that sets forth evocative conditions and possibilities may allow a rich and more vibrant uh, atmosphere to come into being through uh, back and forth interplay of human bodies, cultural histories, materials, environments over time. Ultimately, embracing atmospheric uncertainty is about opening up to the full depth of human existential experience, allowing spaces to tune us in unpredictable yet profoundable resonant ways. Um, and that is what I uh, think uh, is a sensory rich way of uh, working these experiences. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> very, very nice and uh, very in, 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 in spot, I would say. Uh, I, we have a few questions, but also uh, your 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 idea on uh, how atmosphere is uh, acts like uh, you always need to be in the state of out of control yes and in order to uh, enrich your surroundings and uh, recently uh, one our architect uh, defended her phd in arts uh, uh, and her work was on conception and perception, this gap between architect's conception and uh, the people's uh, ability to uh, perceive the surroundings. And uh, one of her very interesting uh, findings actually was that there is a need for a mistake. Yeah. So I, I it resonates with uh, your uh, idea of uh, surprise or uncertainties like... Uh, uh, something that you can find uh, unusual or, or surprising, surprise by surprise. So uh, uh, it seems that uh, in our days, when uh, this um, virtual uh, reality is so close to us, uh, we are very in need to uh, get more sensation around us. Maybe it would be like uh, a new trend in architecture to involve mm -hmm. more sensual uh, things, to be more attentive to material. Yes. Well, the thing is, you can't win a project saying, uh, so... Uh... We don't know how it will unfold, <laughs> you know. So it, this is, has to be handled carefully, I think, so that, uh, of course, you just say, uh, so this is how, how we're going to make it. And uh, we can we can uh, estimate that that we are to to read these goals, etc. But but I think that in as a, as a method sort of in house, uh, I think it adds a quality to to the uh, to the to the architecture that we do, if we allow these moments of um, of uh, you could say uh, allowing a mistake or uh, allowing to 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 let us show something that we cannot foresee. Oh, yes, of course. Thank you. Oh, David Pinder uh, wrote. Thanks so much, Annette fascinating I have, I have to run now but really great to hear this and the same uh, David Clark wrote uh, thank you very much Annette your presentation work is super inspiring yeah I quite agree with them uh, and here's a question uh, Dovila 
Hello, thanks. Uh, thank you for amazing lecture, dear Annette. May I ask you how long you worked with SLA and what kind of experience you have got or have? Thank you. Davide. Yes, yes. So um, as I entered into collaboration with SLA, um, I started working uh, um, sort of nonstop uh, for for nine months within the company. So as if I was an employee, I met uh, each day uh, the and well, sometimes it happened that they would tend to forget that I was not an architect, but in fact, I can't draw. Uh, so, um, but but often they would ask me to do something and I was like, yeah, I, I can help. But um, <laughs> so, um, so, um, and I was there for nine months and then I, I left trying to digest uh, all the data that I produced and so uh, and then we had the COVID uh, pandemic situation where so couldn't really enter the the company again, but we were in contact online, and I did some further following up interviews, and I then um, of course presented the way to, uh, while I was writing the book. So, but but it depends on 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 how you define. Uh, uh, the collaborate collaboration, but I would say it's a nine months, uh, nine months uh, long um, empirical study, sort of more intensively. Um, yes. Was there uh, more questions? Uh, but, uh, just a, a, a small question. Uh, to the same theme. Uh, did you present your findings to the company, and what were their reaction? Yes, yes, that's a very good question. I was, um, I was actually very surprised that they, um, they, they took so many notes. And actually, after I, um, I presented the work, they started to integrate the findings, and uh, they made a new homepage where they explicitly say. Uh, and I actually have I have an image of that. Uh, we do collages to visualize uh, how we work with the uh, atmosphere, and so so so. Uh, and in a way, that's interesting because when you enter the field, they might not have talked that much about atmosphere beforehand. Of course, they did a bit because that was my entrance. That was the reason why I chose them. But also, I think I provoked their way of working so so i am i'm no neutral person here so because i of course they attended to this the uh, the interest of mine and got curious about it so the focus got perhaps even stronger you could say but but uh, to some of the ideas i think they 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 actually nodded and what many of them say is that um Actually, just thank you. So we know that we do that, but we didn't know, or we know that we do it, but we didn't have the words for telling others what we do. So now we got your words for what 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 we do. So in a way, that was how um, they reacted. Um, yeah. Very nice way in collaboration between scientists and uh artist architects in this case uh, so one more question Rasa yeah. wrote uh, dear Annette uh, thank you for your lecture uh, my question would be about abilities to perceive the atmospheres by people using different sensory receptors like people of blind community deaf community do you have experience working with different sensory groups thank you Rasa Yes, that's a very good question uh, that I cannot really answer because I am, I didn't follow how, for instance, dis disabled people engage uh, in, uh, in architecture. So I didn't study the user perspective. 
However, I have done that before. So in my PhD, I did uh, hospital studies. So that's a whole different story. But this is uh, that what, what was very interesting there was um, that 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 um, when we are ill or or stressed or um, um, worried. Uh, to um to a serious degree we can't take in that much of our environment actually and we don't really reflect in the same way but there can be needs for instance where we in, where we would not like to get surprised where we would actually like a space not intruding where we could stay uh and and feel as we would like to feel, no one telling us how to feel. Uh, so, um, and so that is, but that's another story that was from a user perspective. There are many other observations that I did. They, 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 I did them long ago. So present right now was to, to tell you some points about the image making in them um, <laughs> um, from a designer's perspective, but it's actually very important. So the question really addresses something very important. That is how these perspectives meet. So I can only tell how designers reflect on the user perspective um and and what would be very interesting is then to follow for instance uh, uh, a space developed and then see how it how the life it it it, it lives uh, through uh, citizens for instance mm. disabled people etc yeah it's very interesting and very important. So there's there's a lot of work to do still. Yeah, and actually, Rosa and the others, uh, uh, I'm announcing we are having lecture of the same cycle of lectures in the autumn, and the uh, architect from uh, Bell, Bell, Belge, Peter William Vermeer, will. Uh, uh, called the lecture Enriching and Understanding of Architecture Through Disability Experiences. He's making such a... We will definitely show up, yes. Yes, yes. It's, and actually, Ressa herself, with partners and collaboration with Japan artists, are uh, making also some uh, sensoric investigations and uh, in uh, connection with this uh, disability people people of disability. Rasa, could you present some of uh, your findings uh, shortly, something to discuss? Rasa? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, I've been working with a community of blind people since 2019. And what I was interested in is how they perceive their environment, but not in the way as to create some special environments for the blind people, but as to learn from the blind people and work with them as a collaborator to enrich our environment, our uh, as uh, seeing people, because um, it's uh, commonly known that uh, the contemporary person is very focused on um, perceiving uh, their environment or through eyes. It's like the most inform information is coming through the visual aspect. But, um, well, probably it's all started with uh, how the architectural projects are presented to the um, communities, to, uh, to the citizens, to the non-professionals. And they are usually presented via some beautiful pictures, uh, beautiful renders or collages that many people um, are not able to read as a uh, as a professional would uh, and they perceive a lot of the uh, atmosphere that is presented in those images but there is a lot of space for manipulation you know like if you are a developer and you want to sell something you can alter this image as so people would feel that it is uh, very appealing very nice uh, but uh, what you experience in reality after the project is built and what you consider 
during the design process you know like usually you consider the aesthetic aspect the economical aspect on all these things and these uh, acoustical qualities uh, sensory textural qualities how the spaces feel i think the problem is that many architects do not have the do not have the experience and do not have the competence to to solve these problems and there are like so many unanswered uh, questions of how we can make these spaces uh, more appealing and yeah, of course, there are many aspects of accessibility, but I think that's a different question about how to work with the spaces of accessibility. But another aspect is how we can work with the spaces uh, of the uh, aesthetic quality, you know, like we can we are really know how to work with the spaces uh, of the visual aspect, uh, uh, aesthetic qualities. But do we know how to make uh, spaces um, audially uh, aesthetic? or a texturally aesthetic. And it's, uh, I think uh, this, I find this very interesting and we are trying to work with the blind community to answering these questions. And we also uh, did some projects in the collaboration with the Japanese architects and the Japanese blind community as well as Lithuanian ones. And um, well, some things are universal, but some things are cultural, you know? So there are also very, like uh, so many things to research and to to know. So that's why I was asking you uh, from a different country with your own experience, like if you have experience so with that, and that would be very interesting to, you know, to know and to learn. Yeah, uh, that's it. So we are working yeah. further. And uh, if you uh, if you want to keep in touch or to share some things, that would be very interesting. and. Uh, Ida has my contact as uh, well, so, so. Yes, yes, I, Thank I you. definitely will pass to Annette. Uh, and um, one more question. Uh, Jurgis is asking, uh, again, thank for your lecture, creation, lose some control and ex expressionism, got result what you want. And how about realization must be full control of builders to maintain designed feeling of atmosphere on site or let some improvisation. So again, I should just to understand uh, what about the realization? Yes. Uh, in the sense of what can, can, can you please? Um, yeah. I also, I, uh, Jurgi Galilė tuviškai truputį pa, pa, išplėsti savo, uh, savo mm, klausimą. Nu, tai galiu. E, šitagi, kai, A, pavyzdžiui, sukūrė jau kažką, kas atrodo tą atmosferišką ir klausimas yra realizacija. Ar, e, Kaip sakyt, jau tada turi statybininkus kontroliuoti visiškai, ta prasme, kad grinai iš 100 procentų pastatytų taip kaip sumanyta, ar, sakykime, reiškia, statybos metu galima kažką bandyti vietoj, reiškia, jeigu matai, kad galbūt taip yra geriau, ar tai teisingas būtų. Bet, bet tai pats architektas ir, ir darytų tos improvizacijos, ar jūs tik to menėjai? Taip, taip, taip. Nes statybininkai tu tik sugadint, supaprastintų. Aišku, aišku. Uh, so uh, he is asking uh, uh, if uh, the architect uh, should totally control the builders in order to get uh, this uh, project design uh, in reality, like the same atmosphere as it was designed, or uh, should uh, he himself improvise in situ? So uh, I, I uh, yes, it's, um, if I understand the question, please correct me if I don't. But uh, but uh, if I don't address it uh, correctly, but um, so I don't think that we can uh, design an atmosphere. We don't know how it will uh, how it will appear out there. We they are atmospheres are unpredictable in the sense that they 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 are to unfold between the users their exact situation as raza said is a cultural thing also so 
it's very situated and uh, dependent on on uh, on the culture and the people who are there um so what we can do is to uh, open up for potentials and uh, sort of um, if we integrate, you know, sound uh, and think about how would it be to sense uh, uh, sound in the space? How would it be to feel, see the water, to hear the water, to get wet, uh, uh, et cetera? What, what would, how, how would that feel? But we, uh, so that, that's the most we can do to then um, um, sh um, we, we can claim that we, that we design a, a, or produce potentials, things to happen. So that's a gift to the, to the public. Here are some potentials uh, uh, through these uh, materials and the organization, uh, things can happen. But as soon as we try to determine, you know, here we have happy colors on the wall. We know that if we got these happy colors on the wall, they will fall flat uh, oh, or start to annoy uh, or sort of um, or get outdated or, you know, uh, let me get rid of that. So there is something about allowing people to you know, not only sense, but also feel that that's why I address atmosphere, but feel in the way that they uh, find most natural in that situation. And I think that the design uh, most successfully could handle these potentials for that, uh, for things to happen and unfold. Does that Makes sense. Is that a way to address this, Jurgis? Jurgis, a second question. Hey, hey. Yes. Yes. Um, so, uh, maybe a uh, auditoria. Uh, someone wants to ask the last question, as we have to say goodbye to Annette and to thank her for this inspiring lecture. I hope very much that some at least uh, architects uh, offices will take this knowledge from, uh, and if, uh, I wonder if uh, SLA is um, uh, open to uh, use the method of uh, creation of atmospheres. Are they aware that now every in the world knows about the method? Well, well, they have agreed that I can share the knowledge and uh, and uh, you know I, the book is published, open for uh, open. Yeah, so uh, I guess that's that's uh, that's the agreement. <laughs> yeah, Great. it is a peek behind the curtain. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah. What is the issue you are working now, right now with? So right now I I follow landscape architects uh, um, and um, but 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 what what I would like to carry on is that more is to think more about the social uh, sustainability and and that's exactly why I find it so interesting what what Rasa addresses here um, with. Um, with uh, people with uh, hearing disabilities or seeing disabilities, um, uh, that's, that's crucial to address. And we know so little about this. Um, <clears throat> so um, yes, I did a PhD about smell. Uh, so that's also something uh, or that, that is, is under addressed in, in, um, in our field. So- um, Especially in hospitals. Especially in hospitals. <laughs> yeah, everyone uh, knows and is, uh, I guess, afraid of that smell when approaches doctors. Yes, um, but what, what I saw in, in at least in my studies is that people talk about that smell, uh, but what is it? And, and the thing is that um, we smell very differently and we don't know if we can smell the exact same smell. 
So uh, not only so physically and neurobiologically, we're not sure about uh, if we whether we smell the same smell. That's one thing. And then the other thing is that it's a culture phenomena. So we um, we um, we uh, we interpret uh, smell differently. We, we uh, what we like and what we dislike is cultural dependent. So when I ask people uh, how the hospital smells, you will have 70 uh, different versions of, of uh, how a hospital smell. Um, so, and actually I did a paper about the smell of nothing. So, so actually this absence of smells where, where it's uh, all is disinfectants and, you know, it's very sterile. Um, that is, uh, also an atmosphere that is, uh, that is very, um, uh, uh, important to notice uh, how 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 it actually feels to to be involved in uh, in these absences of smell and cleanliness. Uh, mm. So not only dirt but also sterility. And of course, it's a little bit maybe difficult to, to uh, create some at, uh, atmospheric smell in the city, <laughs> or is it possible? To create well, it smells everywhere. Um, so and but we get we get um, um, when we smell, we we can only detect the smell for a couple of seconds. Then we start to get uh, used to it, and then we can't smell it anymore. So um, so how to work with that? Uh, for instance, I know that landscape architects work with different plantings um, that can attract and uh, create some diversity um, that we can attend to as a way to to make it more sensory lively. Wow. Wonderful. Oh, wonderful. So we are looking forward to new publications of yours. Yeah. And uh, meanwhile, maybe uh, we are saying uh, goodbye. Thank you once more, Anit, for your inspiring talk. Uh, and uh, for other people, I want to share once more the announcement of our next uh, lesson. Uh, and lecture and sveiki, tai atsisveikinimui noriu tiesiog pristatyti jums sekančią mūsų paskaitą. Tai yra architektas urbanistas Tomas Butkus, skaitys paskaitą architektūrinę aplinką ir jos poveikį žmogų psichoemociniai geroviai. Paskaitoj jisai klausė, ar yra alternatyva tam dabar jau daug technologijų pasitelkinčiam aplinkom ir kaip vis dėlto sukurti tą žmogui patogę ir, ir emociškai teigimai veikiančią aplinką, tom įprastom priemonėm, ką kalba medžiagos, tai ačiū dar kartą visiems, kas klausėtės ir iki kito karto paskaita, kaip matote, bus rugsėjai, rugsėjai 11, registracija jau atidaryta, lauksit.